This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Annie Coleman on December 19, 2005, in St. Louis, Missouri. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Chapter 29. Mr. Collins's triumph, in consequence of this invitation, was complete. The power of displaying the grandeur of his patroness to his wondering visitors, and of letting them see her civility towards himself and his wife, was exactly what he had wished for, and that an opportunity of doing it should be given so soon was such an instance of Lady Catherine's condescension as he knew not how to admire enough. I confess, said he, that I should not have been at all surprised by her ladyship's asking us on Sunday to drink tea and spend the evening at Rosings. I rather expected, from my knowledge of her affability, that it would happen. But who could have foreseen such an attention as this? Who could have imagined that we should receive an invitation to dine there? An invitation, moreover, including the whole party." so immediately after your arrival. "'I am the less surprised at what has happened,' replied Sir William, "'from that knowledge of what the matters of the great really are, which my situation in life has allowed me to acquire. About the court such instances of elegant breeding are not uncommon.' Scarcely anything was talked of the whole day or next morning but their visit to Rosings. Mr. Collins was carefully instructing them in what they were to expect, that the sight of such rooms, so many servants, and so splendid a dinner might not wholly overpower them. When the ladies were separating for the toilette, he said to Elizabeth, "'Do not make yourself uneasy, my dear cousin, about your apparel. Lady Catherine is far from requiring that elegance of dress in us which becomes herself and her daughter.' I would advise you merely to put on whatever of your clothes is superior to the rest. There is no occasion for anything more. Lady Catherine will not think the worse of you for being simply dressed. She likes to have the distinction of rank preserved. While they were dressing, he came two or three times to their different doors to recommend their being quick, as Lady Catherine very much objected to be kept waiting for her dinner. Such formidable accounts of her ladyship and her manner of living quite frightened Maria Lucas, who had been little used to company, and she looked forward to her introduction at Rosings with as much apprehension as her father had done to his presentation at St. James's. As the weather was fine, they had a pleasant walk of about half a mile across the park. Every park has its beauty and its prospects and Elizabeth saw much to be pleased with, though she could not be in such raptures as Mr. Collins expected the scene to inspire, and was but slightly affected by his enumeration of the windows in front of the house, and his relation of what the glazing altogether had originally cost Sir Louis de Bourg. When they ascended the steps to the hall, Maria's alarm was every moment increasing, and even Sir William did not look perfectly calm. Elizabeth's courage did not fail her. She had heard nothing of Lady Catherine that spoke her awful from any extraordinary talents or miraculous virtue, and the mere stateliness of money or rank she thought she could witness without trepidation. From the entrance hall, of which Mr. Collins pointed out with a rapturous air the fine proportion and the finished ornaments, they followed the servants through an antechamber to the room where Lady Catherine, her daughter, and Mrs. Jenkinson were sitting. Her ladyship, with great condescension, arose to receive them, and as Mrs. Collins had settled it with her husband that the office of introduction should be hers, it was performed in a proper manner, without any of those apologies and thanks which he would have thought necessary. In spite of having been at St. James's Sir William was so completely awed by the grandeur surrounding him that he had but just courage enough to make a very low bow 
and take his seat without saying a word. And his daughter, frightened almost out of her senses, sat on the edge of her chair, not knowing which way to look. Elizabeth found herself quite equal to the scene, and could observe the three ladies before her composedly. Lady Catherine was a tall, large woman, with strongly marked features, which might once have been handsome. Her air was not conciliating, nor was her manner of receiving them such as to make her visitors forget their inferior rank. She was not rendered formidable by silence, but whatever she said was spoken in so authoritative a tone as marked her self-importance, and brought Mr. Wickham immediately to Elizabeth's mind. And from the observation of the day altogether, she believed Lady Catherine to be exactly what he represented. When, after examining the mother, in whose countenance and deportment she soon found some resemblance of Mr. Darcy, she turned her eyes on the daughter. She could almost have joined in Maria's astonishment at her being so thin and so small. There was neither in figure nor face any likeness between the ladies. Miss de Bourg was pale and sickly. Her features, though not plain, were insignificant, and she spoke very little, except in a low voice to Mrs. Jenkinson, in whose appearance there was nothing remarkable, and who was entirely engaged in listening to what she said, and placing a screen in the proper direction before her eyes. After sitting a few minutes, they were all sent to one of the windows to admire the view. Mr. Collins attending them to point out its beauties, and Lady Catherine kindly informing them that it was much better worth looking at in the summer. The dinner was exceedingly handsome, and there were all the servants and all the articles of plate which Mr. Collins had promised, and as he had likewise foretold, he took his seat at the bottom of the table, by her ladyship's desire, and looked as if he felt that life could furnish nothing greater. He carved and ate and praised with delighted alacrity, and every dish was commended, first by him and then by Sir William, who is now enough recovered to echo whatever his son-in-law said, in a manner which Elizabeth wondered Lady Catherine could bear. But Lady Catherine seemed gratified by their excessive admiration, and gave most gracious smiles especially when any dish on the table proved a novelty to them. The party did not supply much conversation. Elizabeth was ready to speak whenever there was an opening, but she was seated between Charlotte and Miss de Bourg, the former of whom was engaged in listening to Lady Catherine, and the latter said not a word to her all dinner-time. Mrs. Jenkinson was chiefly employed in watching how little Miss de Bourg ate pressing her to try some other dish, and fearing she was indisposed. Maria thought speaking out of the question, and the gentlemen did nothing but eat and admire. When the ladies returned to the drawing-room, there was little to be done but to hear Lady Catherine talk, which she did without any intermission, till coffee came in, delivering her opinion on every subject in so decisive a manner as proved that she was not used to have her judgment controverted. She inquired into Charlotte's domestic concerns familiarly and minutely, gave her a great deal of advice as to the management of them all, told her how everything ought to be regulated in so small a family as hers, and instructed her as to the care of her cows and her poultry. Elizabeth found that nothing was beneath this great lady's attention, which could furnish her with no occasion of dictating to others. In the intervals of her discourse with Mrs. Collins, she addressed a variety of questions to Maria and Elizabeth, but especially to the latter, of whose connections she knew the least, and who she observed to Mrs. Collins, was a very genteel, pretty kind of girl. She asked her at different times how many sisters she had, whether they were older or younger than herself, whether any of them were likely to be married, whether they were handsome, where they had been educated, what carriage her father kept, and what had been her mother's maiden name. Elizabeth felt all the impertinence of her questions, but answered them very composedly. Lady Catherine then observed, 
"'Your father's estate is entailed on Mr. Collins, I think. "'For your sake,' turning to Charlotte, "'I am glad of it. "'But otherwise I see no occasion for entailing estates from the female line. "'It was not thought necessary in Sir Louis de Bourg's family. "'Do you play and sing, Miss Bennet?' "'A little. "'Oh, then, some time or other, we shall be happy to hear you. "'Our instrument is a capital one. "'Probably superior to—' "'You shall try it some day. "'Do your sisters play and sing?' "'One of them does. "'Why did not you all learn? "'You ought all to have learned. "'The Miss Webbs all play, "'and their father has not so good an income as yours. "'Do you draw?' "'No, not at all. "'What? None of you? "'Not one. "'That is very strange. "'But I suppose you had no opportunity.' "'Your mother should have taken you to town every spring "'for the benefit of masters. "'My mother would have had no objection, "'but my father hates London. "'Has your governess left you? "'We never had any governess. "'No governess? How was that possible? Five daughters brought up at home without a governess? "'I never heard of such a thing. "'Your mother must have been quite a slave to your education.' Elizabeth could hardly help smiling as she assured her that had not been the case. Then who taught you? Who attended to you? Without a governess, you must have been neglected. Compared with some families, I believe we were, but such of us as wished to learn never wanted the means. We were always encouraged to read, and had all the masters that were necessary. Those who chose to be idle certainly might. "'Ay, no doubt, but that is what a governess will prevent, "'and if I had known your mother, "'I should have advised her most strenuously to engage one. "'I always say that nothing is to be done in education "'without steady and regular instruction, "'and nobody but a governess can give it. "'It is wonderful how many families I have been the means of supplying in that way. "'I am always glad to get a young person well placed out.' Four nieces of Mrs. Jenkinson are most delightfully situated through my means, and it was but the other day that I recommended another young person, who was merely accidentally mentioned to me, and the family was quite delighted with her. Mrs. Collins, did I tell you of Lady Metcalfe's calling yesterday to thank me? She finds Miss Pope a treasure. Lady Catherine, she said, you have given me a treasure. "'Are any of your younger sisters out, Miss Bennet?' "'Yes, ma'am, all.' "'All? What? All five out at once? Very odd. And you only the second. The younger ones out before the elder ones are married? Your younger sisters must be very young.' "'Yes, my youngest is not sixteen. Perhaps she is full young to be much in company.' "'But really, ma'am, I think it will be very hard upon younger sisters "'that they should not have their share of society and amusement "'because the elder may not have the means or inclination to marry early. "'The last-born has as good a right to the pleasures of youth as the first, "'and to be kept back on such a motive, "'I think it would not be very likely to promote sisterly affection or delicacy of mind.' "'Upon my word,' said her ladyship, "'You give your opinion very decidedly for so young a person. "'Pray, what is your age?' "'With three younger sisters grown up,' replied Elizabeth, smiling, "'your ladyship can hardly expect me to own it.' "'Lady Catherine seemed quite astonished at not receiving a direct answer, "'and Elizabeth suspected herself to be the first creature "'who had ever dared to trifle with so much dignified impertinence.' "'You cannot be more than twenty, I am sure. "'Therefore you need not conceal your age. "'I am not one and twenty. "'When the gentlemen had joined them, and tea was over, "'the card-tables were placed. "'Lady Catherine, Sir William, and Mr. and Mrs. Collins "'sat down to quadrille, "'and as Miss de Bourg chose to play at casino, "'the two girls had the honour of assisting Mrs. Jenkins "'to make up her party.' Their table was superlatively stupid. Scarcely a syllable was uttered 
that did not relate to the game, except when Mrs. Jenkinson expressed her fears of Miss de Bourgh's being too hot, or too cold, or having too much, or too little light. A great deal more passed at the other table. Lady Catherine was generally speaking, stating the mistakes of the three others, or relating some anecdote of herself. Mr. Collins was employed in agreeing to everything her ladyship said, thanking her for every fish he won, and apologizing if he thought he won too many. Sir William did not say much. He was storing his memory with anecdotes and noble names. When Lady Catherine and her daughter had played as long as they chose, the tables were broken up. The carriage was offered to Mrs. Collins, gratefully accepted, and immediately ordered. The party then gathered round the fire to hear Lady Catherine determine what weather they were to have on the morrow. From these instructions they were summoned by the arrival of the coach, and with many speeches of thankfulness on Mr. Collins's side, and as many bows on Sir William's, they departed. As soon as they had driven from the door, Elizabeth was called on by her cousin to give her opinion of all that she had seen at Rosings, which, for Charlotte's sake, she made more favorable than it really was. But her commendation, though costing her some trouble, could by no means satisfy Mr. Collins, and he was very soon obliged to take her ladyship's praise into his own hands. End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 Sir William stayed only a week at Hunsford, but his visit was long enough to convince him of his daughter's being most comfortably settled, and of her possessing such a husband and such a neighbor as were not often met with. While Sir William's was with them, Mr. Collins devoted his morning to driving him out in his gig, and showing him the country, but when he went away the whole family returned to their usual employments and Elizabeth was thankful to find that they did not see more of her cousin by the alteration, for the chief of the time between breakfast and dinner was now passed by him either at work in the garden, or in reading and writing, and looking out of the window in his own book-room, which fronted the road. The room in which the ladies sat was backwards. Elizabeth had at first rather wondered that Charlotte should not prefer the dining-parlour for common use, it was a better-sized room, and had a more pleasant aspect, but she soon saw that her friend had an excellent reason for what she did, for Mr. Collins would undoubtedly have been much less in his own apartment, had they sat in one equally lively, and she gave Charlotte credit for the arrangement. From the drawing-room they could distinguish nothing in the lane, and were indebted to Mr. Collins for the knowledge of what carriages went along, and how often especially Miss de Bourgh drove by in her phaeton, which he never failed coming to inform them of, though it happened almost every day. She not unfrequently stopped at the parsonage, and had a few minutes' conversation with Charlotte, but was scarcely ever prevailed upon to get out. Very few days passed in which Mr. Collins did not walk to Rosings, and not many in which his wife did not think it necessary to go likewise until Elizabeth recollected that there might be other family livings to be disposed of, she could not understand the sacrifice of so many hours. Now and then they were honoured with a call from her ladyship, and nothing escaped her observation that was passing in the room during these visits. She examined into their employments, looked at their work, and advised them to do it differently, found fault with the arrangement of the furniture, or detected the housemaid in negligence, and if she accepted any refreshment, seemed to do it only for the sake of finding out that Mrs. Collins's joints of meat were too large for her family. Elizabeth soon perceived that though this great lady was not in commission of the peace of the county, she was a most active magistrate in her own parish, the minutest concerns of which were carried to her by Mr. Collins, and whenever any of the cottages were disposed to be quarrelsome, discontented, or too poor, she sallied forth into the village to settle their differences, silence their complaints, and scold them into harmony and plenty. 
the entertainment of dining at Rosings was repeated about twice a week, and, allowing for the loss of Sir William, and there being only one card-table in the evening, every such entertainment was the counterpart of the first. Their other engagements were few, as the style of living in the neighborhood in general was beyond Mr. Collins's reach. This, however, was no evil to Elizabeth and upon the whole she spent her time comfortably enough. There were half-hours of pleasant conversation with Charlotte, and the weather was so fine for the time of year that she had often great enjoyment out of doors. Her favorite walk, and where she frequently went while the others were calling on Lady Catherine, was along the open grove which edged that side of the park, where there was a nice sheltered path, which no one seemed to value but herself and where she felt beyond the reach of Lady Catherine's curiosity. In this quiet way, the first fortnight of her visit soon passed away. Easter was approaching, and the week preceding it was to bring an addition to the family at Rosings, which in so small a circle must be important. Elizabeth had heard soon after her arrival that Mr. Darcy was expected there in the course of a few weeks and though there were not many of her acquaintances whom she did not prefer, his coming would furnish one comparatively new to look at in their Rosings parties, and she might be amused in seeing how hopeless Miss Bingley's designs on him were, by his behavior to his cousin, for whom he was evidently destined by Lady Catherine, who talked of his coming with the greatest satisfaction, spoke of him in terms of the highest admiration, and seemed almost angry to find that he had already been frequently seen by Miss Lucas and herself. His arrival was soon known at the parsonage, for Mr. Collins was walking the whole morning within view of the lodges opening into Hunsford Lane, in order to have the earliest assurance of it, and, after making his bow as the carriage turned into the park, hurried home with the great intelligence. On the following morning he hastened to Rosings to pay his respects. There were two nephews of Lady Catherine to require them, for Mr. Darcy had brought with him a Colonel Fitzwilliam, the younger son of his uncle Lord Fitzwilliam, and, to the great surprise of all the party, when Mr. Collins returned, the gentlemen accompanied him. Charlotte had seen them from her husband's room, crossing the road, and immediately running into the other, told the girls what an honor they might expect, adding, I may thank you, Eliza, for this piece of civility. Mr. Darcy would never have come so soon to wait upon me. Elizabeth had scarcely time to disclaim all right to the compliment, before their approach was announced by the door-bell, and shortly afterwards the three gentlemen entered the room. Colonel Fitzwilliam, who led the way, was about thirty not handsome, but in person and address, most truly the gentleman. Mr. Darcy looked just as he had been used to look in Hertfordshire, paid his compliments with his usual reserve to Mrs. Collins, and, whatever might be his feelings towards her friend, met her with every appearance of composure. Elizabeth merely curtsied to him, without saying a word. Colonel Fitzwilliam entered into conversation directly with the readiness and ease of a well-bred man, and talked very pleasantly, but his cousin, after having addressed a slight observation on the house and garden to Mrs. Collins, sat for some time without speaking to anybody. At length, however, his civility was so far awakened as to inquire of Elizabeth after the health of her family. She answered him in the usual way, and after a moment's pause added, "'My eldest sister has been in town these three months. "'Have you never happened to see her?' "'She was perfectly sensible that he never had, "'but she wished to see whether he would betray any consciousness "'of what had passed between the Bingleys and Jane, "'and she thought he looked a little confused "'as he answered that he had never been so fortunate "'as to meet Miss Bennet. "'The subject was pursued no farther, "'and the gentleman soon afterwards went away.' End of chapter 30